Hey, there it goes. Boom. All right. We made it. We did it. <laughs> We're living the dream. Oh, welcome to Talking Heads, everyone. Episode 323, your once weekly live show for the latest in beer and tech news. I'm Jeff. I'm Rhett. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us on this Wednesday night or in podcast form over on Anchor.fm or wherever your favorite podcasts are found. If you've never seen the show before, we talk beer, we talk tech, we talk games, pop culture, entertainment, usually some Star Trek. All Super Chats are run on the air so long as they will not permanently demonetize the channel. An even better way to help support the show, though, is to head on over to craftcomputing.store, grab one of our fancy nucleated pint glasses, and start drinking like a pro. Last but not least, uh, well, no, not last but not least, uh, we also drink alcohol in the show. There we go. And if we're drinking along with us, alcoholic or not, let us know in the chat and we'll give some early show shout outs as we go along. Last but not least, if you'd like to take part in the super secret chat and the even more super secret after party, think about joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server where you can chat with myself, John, Brett, Steve, all the hosts from Talking Heads, and join the awesome community that hangs out over there. And now it's a show. <laughs> We're doing it. All right. We're doing it. A bit choppy on the video tonight. Doubtful. That's just novella. I think it's just novella. It looks super smooth on my end. Looks pretty good to me, too. Last yeah. time I was on the show, two weeks ago, I had to um, stop incoming and outgoing video on Zoom <laughs> in order to have a conversation <laughs> in real time with Jeff. I will say and, uh, OBS did some weird things last week with Steve as well on my end yeah. of things, but uh, hopefully we're, uh, we're back up and going. It ended up working out. We had a good show last time when I was on, and uh, I don't know. I don't know if it was just because I was like really tuned in to listening because it's all I had, <laughs> but it was good. Reminded me of the old podcasting days. Yeah. yeah you know, believe it or not, all of the remote podcasts I did over the years. Ne I only did like maybe two or three with video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I can say is I just pulled up the stream and it is 1080, 30, perfect. So if you're having issues, it's on your end. <laughs> yeah. Per ha if you try to, uh, de uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> crap, come, be ink. Ah, you see what I did? I, I saw what you did. You think you're clever. I mean, it was very clever. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a good show tonight. Uh, last show before the leap day. It, it is a leap year after all. So we've got the 29th coming up tomorrow. Uh, and the last show before Mixology March. Woohoo! We are returning with Mixology March uh, on the channel here for the month of March. It's going to be all cocktails all the time. Should be a fun time. Uh, and we also started this tradition last year, and I think we kind of want to keep it going this year. And that is uh, uh, Big Stout Day to end <laughs> into the month with, uh, in the month of February with. Uh, I won't be opening with this one, but I will be opening it tonight. Uh, I've got a Adroit Theory 14% Extremely Extreme Russian Imperial Stout. Uh, so we'll get to that later. Uh, but I'm starting off with a Silver, Far off, Sil nah, Silver Falls Brewery. Ooh! The Great Emu War. Oh, nice. Good choice. Hazy IPA. Fantastic IPA. I was IPA. just at Silver Falls. Yeah. I, I was picking up my, my dinner order. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, anyway, what are you uh, clocking in with tonight, Rhett? Well, I didn't know that it was Big Stout Night, but I lucked out. For the first ever uh, Big Stout Night uh, thing that I remember to do, I guess it's not that big. I'm doing the double chocolate stout from Rogue. So That's a solid choice. It is good, man. I've drank three of these so far, and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. So, um, you know, it's really chocolate. Yes. There's Which, a reason they call it the double chocolate stout. I know. And you think to yourself, like, is it that chocolatey? And then you drink it and you're like, well, 
rogues never lied to me before and they certainly aren't now right oh, I have a feeling it's going to be a good show mm. don't make fun of my head but there you go it's really dark looking <laughs> <laughs> boom cheers hey, hey, cheers you see what I did there <laughs> yeah I did I did <laughs> I actually got this cup at the Cheers Bar in yes. Boston. So, yes. A couple of people chiming in that it's choppy on their end as well. A couple of people saying it must be AT and T. Yeah. Can oh, you hear me now? Uh, oh wait, was that the other one? <laughs> yeah, that was the other one. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, let's see. People chiming in with some beers. Uh, we've got Skull opening a Confluence Brewing Polk County Stout 2023 IBU Open Winner. Uh, 13.5%. Uh, BB Junkies got a Me My Mate uh, uh, Arbornoth. Ar Arbornoth. Arbornoth. There we go. Uh, <laughs> are enjoying a nice glass of mead. Excellent. Sorry, pronouncing screen names is one of the weirdest things to try to do at first glance. Like, mm -hmm. I can screen, I can sight read music with the best of them. Screen names? No. <laughs> uh, let's see. Williams got a bottle of Bourbon County Stout. Speaking of uh, a big stout. Uh, Michael's got a Westside Brewing Single Hop IPA, Galaxy 7%. Uh, 3.7 rating on Untapped. Uh, Dagamore's got a Spayburn 10 single year, uh, uh, single malt. There we go. 10 year single malt. That's always a good one. I do like Spayburn. I think I said Spayburn. Spayburn. Uh, let's see. Oftfinity. Oftinfinity's got a Market Garden Brewery Beastie American Stout, 7.2%. Revs drinking a Nankasi Total Domination Northwest IPA. Uh, honestly, become his go to out here. 7%, 3.7 on untapped. Uh, Skull says we need a shopping list before next week's show. Uh, I will be hopefully planning my cocktails more than a day in advance. So I'm going to try to plan the cocktails for the month and maybe on Monday uh, post a shopping list for those who want to join me in that journey. Uh, I will say I've got a couple of uh, really nice bottles already planned out to make some cocktails with, including an espresso liqueur that has just mm. been dynamite as of late. So more on that shortly. Uh, Novella Hub Bur Boulevard Brewing Brewer's Choice Bourbon Barrel Aged Chocolate Dipped Cherry Stout. Holy freaking crap. 15%, <laughs> 3 oh. 3.99 on Untapped. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, like I said, I think it's going to be a good show. Thinking so. Got my beer poured. Yes. Cheers, cheers to you, buddy. Cheers, my friend. Mm. By the way, I said this wasn't that big, but it is nine percent apparently. <laughs> it's not small. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking it was like seven, maybe at most. <laughs> Oh, no, they, they do have a chocolate stout, and I think their chocolate stout is like seven. But yeah, the, the double yeah. chocolate is nine. This is so good. It literally tastes like melted Hershey's bars. Yeah. I, I'm not a big sweet beer drinker, but, um, you know, I'll do a few of these. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought I was done with beer shout outs, but then Jason posts one that has, has me saying, I think I need that beer. Uh, Jason is drinking a Jeff Brewing Party Boat IPA at 8%. <laughs> uh, if ever there was a beer I needed to try, it's probably from Jeff Brewing, because I also love a good party boat. And their their slogan is, for all the Jeffs out there, mm -hmm. this is Jeff Brewing. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, where is where is Jeff Brewing from? I, I need to know. I need to know Jeffrey, where Indiana. I can get that beer. Yeah. 
I, it feels like a Midwest brewery. There's a Port Jeff Brewing. That's fun. Jefferson, New York. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, yeah, all I can find is Port Jeff Brewing. Is there a Jeff Brewing mm. company? Mm. I, I, I need to know. I, I, Jeff Brewing That's... from some guy's basement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think we'll answer one question, but then we need to dive into the news because, oh man, it is we got a lot. It's kind of a jam-packed week. Uh, what are the ingredients to have on hand for a proper old-fashioned? That is a great, great question. We'll cover this more. I usually cover the old-fashioned every single March. Uh, it's a it's a cocktail you need to know. Uh, the simplest version of an old-fashioned is sugar, bitters, and whiskey. That's it. Make yourself up a simple syrup. Two to one, uh, by weight, sugar to water. Uh, heat that to right about 150 degrees, uh, right around 60, 65 degrees Celsius, give or take. Let it, let your water simmer at that for a little bit. Add in your sugar slowly, mix it all up. Uh, you want a nice thick sugar uh, or a nice thick syrup because a two to one sugar is shelf stable. Uh, it won't mold, it won't degrade, it won't break down. Uh, that's how you're supposed to make it. Uh, for bitters, Angostura is kind of the go-to, but a nice aromatic bitter uh, is what you want. Uh, I also know Bitter Housewife makes a fantastic aromatic bitters that I really like. Uh, and I've had a number of other bitters as well over the years, but uh, can't go wrong with Angostura. And then I like a rye, old-fashioned. I prefer a rye blend whiskey uh, or a rye recipe whiskey. Uh, two and a half ounces of rye, half ounce to three quarter ounce of your simple, depending on how sweet you like it. And then three to four dashes of Angostura. Mix that over a giant rock and enjoy. Personally, I don't think it's not a, it's not an old fashioned if it isn't made with seven crown. You know what I'm saying? That's old fashioned right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh <laughs> what what's the point of all of this <laughs> syrup and uh fun yummy stuff if you're gonna add it to good whiskey okay <laughs> i will say uh greg over at how to drink posted his most in-depth uh uh retrospective of the old-fashioned just a couple of weeks ago uh, if you have, if you're at all curious about the history of the old fashioned, he dug further into it than I've heard anyone take it before, and uh, I think the results are pretty fantastic. Um, he actually tried both the old fashioned as like you would have made it when people were saying, "Don't give me that newfangled crap, give me it old fashioned." Um, he made it that style. wasn't great, uh, <laughs> and and there's a lot of explanation as to why. Um, but uh, likely what people were trying to get away from was an improved whiskey cocktail. Uh, also a Sazerac is kind of a, a, an offshoot of the improved whiskey cocktail. Sazerac's one of my favorite all-time cocktails. Uh, and I, I covered that one a couple years ago in some pretty great depth on an episode of, of uh, Craft Computing. So, And what's funny is uh, I, I, I made some modifications and I said, people of New Orleans, I'm sorry, but this is my Sazerac. And they went, that's a good Sazerac. Cheers. <laughs> so I, I got some people in New Orleans to, to sign off on it. It's not hard to get them to sign off on booze, Jeff. Okay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, Jeff, will you do the cold brew whiskey old fashioned for Mixology March? I am bringing back the cold brew whiskey. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, if you want a janky whiskey for mixing, go with a plastic bottle of Black Velvet. Black Velvet is the most god awful whiskey ever. It's but it's cheap. So is Evan Williams, and Evan Williams is three times the whiskey that Black Velvet is. I'm telling you, you guys want to go with a cheap whiskey? Get yourself a jug of Seven Crown. Okay. Yep. Seagram 7. <laughs> yeah. Seagram 7 is kind of my go-to bulk whiskey. It is my house whiskey. 
because it's a great mixer. Do I sit there and sip on it? No, I'm not going to pour it over ice. I'm not going to pour it in a, in a Glen Karen. But you know what? It tastes like whiskey in every mixed cocktail you could make. Can you get better whiskey and make better cocktails with? Absolutely. But if you it's, want... It's one of those... If you want a I standard swear. version of a cocktail, it's hard to go wrong with Seagram 7. Yeah. It's funny because uh, Seven Crown has always kind of tasted to me like the essence of whiskey. Like they're like, let's just make it as whiskey as possible. <laughs> and, you know, it definitely is one of those cheaper whiskeys that burns a little bit on the way down. It's not like a smooth whiskey taste. I think... Um, I was going to say, like, I think Black Velvet's a little smoother, in my opinion, but it's definitely pretty strong tasting, too. That, that burny taste. It's been a while, though. Lots and lots and lots of cocktail talk coming up next week, but for right now, let's keep it on beer, and let's start with the news. Starting with let's Intel. Pat Gelsinger making some waves uh, with some comments earlier this week, uh, which was, look, I, sensationalized a little bit. Uh, so people are kind of freaking out because in a, a recent talk, in a talk, uh, what, what was this on Monday, uh, Pat, Pat Gelsinger revealed a roadmap for Intel fab capacity uh, over the next number of years. Uh, and on the roadmap, we already knew Intel 14A, which is their 1.4 nanometer fab. Uh, we already knew that was going to be essentially going live uh, sometime at the end of 2025. Uh, on the roadmap, though, is Intel 10A. Now... A in Intel's roadmap stands for angstrom, which is a uh, one-tenth of one nanometer. So 14A is 1.4 nanometer. 10A would be one nanometer. Uh, now, a lot of uh, news outlets saw 10A and went, holy crap, Intel's going to start producing one nanometer chips at the end of 2027 either Q4 or Q1 2028, like one nanometer's coming, baby. Let's bump the brakes. Let's bump the brakes a little bit um, because the the charts here, I know they're pretty low resolution, kind of clearly show that if this is 2027 and you draw a straight line up right here, you start producing. However, the percentage of the pie is so incredibly small <laughs> as to be non-existent. Uh, even through 2028 and entering 2029, that's like 1%. Do you know what 1% is? That is testing capacity. That is starting to produce things to test for future deployments. We are not going to be getting one nanometer chips in 2027 or 2028, or 2029, for that matter. Like, we're probably looking 2030, 2032 for actually receiving one nanometer. Maybe not that far off, but it's not going to be 2027. We know that TSMC and Samsung have 2 nanometer and 1.4 nanometer on their roadmaps. Uh, and, you know, within, like, 2029, we should start seeing some 2 nanometer parts. We are seeing 5 nanometer parts and even four and three nanometer parts in some things starting to come out. Uh, but uh, getting down to one nanometer, that's that's quite the leap. Now, also keep in mind, one nanometer Intel fab is different from internal Intel one nanometer developed parts. This doesn't necessarily mean Intel is going to be producing Intel core or Intel CPUs or GPUs or whatever on that one nanometer fab. They're saying, as far as their fab ability goes, they will be able to produce one nanometer for customers, for customers of Intel, not customers of Intel directly. 
Will we be seeing one nanometer Intel parts in 2027? No. Will we be seeing parts out of Intel at one nanometer sometime in 2029? Uh, whether that's Microsoft, IBM, uh, or various other partners that are kind of rumored, Ericsson, that are kind of rumored to be looking at Intel for this? Potentially. 14 nanometer plus infinity. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so pump the brakes on this a little bit. Now, I did bring up this exact question uh, with some of my colleagues. Uh, I'm not going to name any names. I, I don't want to out anyone's opinion or put words in anyone's mouth. So just know that I talked about this privately earlier today uh, with some colleagues of mine. And uh, the concession was one nanometer on Intel's roadmap. It's impressive. But what's going to make or break Intel is 18A. Is can Intel get to that 1.8 nanometer or 2 nanometer and start producing chips? And as Pat Gilsinger put it, they have literally bet the company on 18A. Uh, uh, Tech Tech Potato, Ian Cutrus, recently interviewed, or earlier this week, interviewed Pat Gilsinger and uh, uh, asked stated that Intel's kind of famous for every fab drop betting the company on the next fabrication. Uh, and we saw this a, a good bit with, with 14 nanometer of, you know, they kind of bet the house on being able to go to 10 and then 10 nanometer was delayed, what, five years? Uh, and it's still not huge, not terrific, you know, uh, yeah, the Intel's parts are all 10 nanometer at this point, but they're calling it Intel 7 Fab. Like, that, like that's not disingenuous. Uh, whereas AMD is putting out 5 nanometer parts into the market, like, today. Uh, Intel's still stuck on 10 nanometer. Uh, so, is Intel actually going to be able to, number one, produce 18A in any meaningful numbers in any mass quantities what are their yields going to be like with 18a are they going to be able to internally produce their own architecture on 18a i think that's a great question given intel's recent track record of not being able to shrink their architecture down uh and number two even if they can't do that are they going to be able to sign customers up uh partners up to produce 18a chips for other customers Look, if TSMC and Samsung, which are the number one and two fabs on the planet right now, as far as revenue goes, uh, if they're out there producing two nanometer chips and, and getting down to 1.4, and Intel's just now coming into two nanometer, and their yields are, you know, 50%, 60% what the other fabs are getting, they're, Intel's going to be in some real trouble. Yeah, Intel's going to be in some real trouble. <clears throat> well, it's interesting to think about too. You know, I didn't think about this until. Well, I don't know how much it factors in. You know, but all news is kind of sensationalist at its heart, anyways, these mm -hmm. days, because otherwise it doesn't get any clicks. But one of the things to think about too is that at a when Gelsinger gets a chance to deliver a keynote like this, you know, it's an opportunity to increase their, um, you know, their share prices <laughs> and. Uh, um, I saw a couple of stories, you know, uh, related to this about how Intel's share price, you know, ticked up a few points after after the speech and all this. And I think it's important to remember that part of the game, too, is talking up what you're going to do and, you know, mm -hmm. betting the farm on on, you know, getting the next process down. Um you know, it's a nice PR story. It uh, sells well to the shareholders. It sounds good, and it's going to make the line tick up a few, uh, a few notches. You know, um, I mean, either way, it's kind of it's kind of interesting stuff. And if anybody hasn't watched the interview with uh, Ian Ketris, I mean, it's a great interview. Yeah. Um, and it's you know. Gelsinger really knows what he's talking about. I thought it, just his his very confident delivery of all that. I mean, you got to be confident when you're in his chair, but right. Most CEOs but, are confident. Uh, the one thing about Gelsinger is he is an engineer. 
like at heart. Yeah. Like he he's not he's not a CEO that's just a finance guy or or uh, he started at that. Intel when he was 18 years old. Yeah. In like I think it was 79 or something like that. 1979. Yeah. And he worked there for 30 years before moving to another company. <laughs> yeah. So you got to you got to imagine that a guy like that knows Intel inside out. He knows what they're capable because he's it's not like he's just some business school major coming off the streets to try and whip them into shape. Like he knows what he's talking about. Right. And, you know, a little bit of Oregon pride, you know, it, he's he he's uh, worked at Intel in Oregon that whole time. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. Woohoo! He's a local guy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the the thing to pay attention to that I don't want to get get pushed under the rug or ignored is not the fact that one nanometer is showing up on a roadmap. Yes, of course it is. You know, Intel probably has internal roadmaps to like thirty or twenty thirty six. Um, and, and even beyond. I mean, you don't run a company of this size and this scale without knowing where your pieces are going to be 10, 12, 15 years down the road. Uh, a lot of that is educated guessing, but a lot of that is, you know, at, at our current production or our, our current, you know, manufacturing prowess or, you know, the pace of technology and EUV machines and all this kind of stuff will be at this level at this point in time and working towards that end goal. Um, but man, I think there's a lot to be said that Intel might actually be betting the farm on, on being able to, to produce, uh, Gelsinger also made a statement, uh, both at the keynote and then, uh, uh, Ian Cutteris kind of asked him again, is it a little ambitious to say by 2030, you want to be the number two fab on the planet? Uh, because right now TSMC owns the lion's share of fabrication. And uh, Samsung is kind of a distant number two. And then Intel is number three behind Samsung. Um, the The question was really, uh, what do you mean by number two? Is that by volume? Because you're never going to hit TSMC for volume. He goes, no, I think by revenue. And uh, and I think, you know, including all aspects of, of the business, uh, of, uh, of our production business. Uh, now that was not including Intel's internal production. That is not making Intel products and selling Intel branded products and including that in like, hey, look at us, we're number one. Pat ourselves on the back, you know, Obama giving Obama a medal. Um, <laughs> he wants to be the number two fab uh, by uh, production customer or by signing up NVIDIA to produce, you know, graphics chips or signing up, whoever else to make make CPUs, signing up IBM or Microsoft to make products uh, and, and become the fab four. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's great to have goals. Uh, and and honestly, if Intel, if Intel is to be believed, uh, I they might be well on their way to, to overtaking Samsung. Uh, but again, the big question is, how will that, the 20A and the 18A fabs go? Because that's yeah. going to be the, the telling thing of, is Intel going to compete in this new chip landscape or are they going to be left behind like they were in 2016? Time will tell. Uh, Mike uh, chimes in. If they couldn't make transistors smaller going from 14 to 7, I wonder what they're going to do with one nanometer. The issue wasn't necessarily uh, Intel production capabilities. The issue from 14 to 7, or 14 to 10 even, was the way that their architecture was built. And uh, the the design of their transistors with Intel Core architecture, their, their CPU manufacturing design, um, lended itself to not scale and not uh, provide good enough yields. Intel can produce seven nanometer parts and 10 nanometer parts, uh, depending on the design. And that's just like anyone else. It's their exact CPU design, their architecture did not form properly <laughs> when they tried to go to 10. Okay. 
So, yeah. Keep an eye. Keep an eye on Intel. It's going to be an interesting couple years for them. I know they have at least like four major factories planned um, throughout the world. They got what? Uh, Three in the Ohio, states. And yeah, they've got Arizona. Ohio, New Mexico, Arizona, and Oregon. Um, oh, oh, Oregon. That's right. I forgot they. Well, they're kind of like hitting some roadblocks with that, aren't they? Right, with like maybe not. But then they also got one in Germany, too, planned in Germany. There's one in Germany. There's one in Ireland. Uh, there's their plant in Malaysia. Yeah, they, they, they've got a lot of different plants. Um, so it's going to be interesting to... Uh, the other part of Intel's strategy is they want to be geographically diverse. They want to not produce all of their 10 nanometer parts at one location, or all their 5 nanometer, or all their 2 nanometer. Um, they want to have kind of that global landscape of you can make parts locally or you can make them internationally. And and if there's a natural disaster in Germany, that's not going to shut down our plant in Malaysia and Ohio. So, you know, it's, we can keep things moving. I mean, it's, it's interesting when you think about it. It's interesting when you think about it, and, and people probably don't think about that enough, but that's exactly why when I first started getting into building computers back in the day, I was limited to running Rambus in my rig was because of a tsunami that took out a factory. You know, and I don't know enough of the details. I should look into this. <laughs> so I could actually like say names and stuff. But apparently a freaking tsunami took out one of the primary RAM producing factories in the Pacific. Yep. And uh, we're left with Rambus, which was really crappy to get in when you're building computers because you have to run it in... Uh, in pairs. It was dual channel <laughs> mode. Yeah, it was dual channel and only dual channel. And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you also had to have Terminator sticks. So if you had four slots, yeah. <laughs> you had to have two blanks installed. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good day when I could take out those two blanks. And uh, I upgraded from... How does this work out? I always tell this story because I had like some weird number. So I think I had two... 128 sticks mm -hmm. and two 256 sticks. So then you get like seven. 768. 768. Yeah. Uh, which is like, you know, just an odd number by the time I was like to the age where I could start bragging to my friends. You know, yeah. and everybody starts, dude, I'm running one gig in this. I'm like, oh yeah, I got 768. And they're like, how do you even get but it's that? Rambus. <laughs> so it's divisible by two if you use specific combinations. <laughs> It was so awful. I mean, I remember being in high school and my I, my teacher was like, how? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. It's I all base 16, computer. buddy. <laughs> it's also base 16. Mm. Good old days. Yep. Ran Quake 3 with the best of them. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Had that GeForce 3, baby. Ooh, yeah. Uh, I was a I was an ATI guy back in the day. I, I did have a couple of Nvidia cards, but uh, most of my rigs in the the early two thousands would would have been ATI. Uh, that that three D rage, bro. <laughs> you know where I bought all my hardware? Huh. There was a shop. You know, like where Target is up there in Salem. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a shop across the street where like Nancy's Burgers is now. Uh huh. <laughs> you could just go in there, and they had everything like. It was a used PC uh, hardware shop, and uh, it was a mess. They just had stuff all over the shelves. So you could just kind of pick through it. That's where I bought all the stuff for my first PC. Did that's, not last long after that. That's how I built my first PC. Was uh, This was a uh, couple of years before that, but uh, literally a guy who had worked in PCs or worked as, you know, like a, an IT guy for like 20 years... Um, had collected a whole bunch of old PCs from a whole bunch of offices that he had torn down and liquidated and things like that. Opened a little shop in downtown Springfield, Oregon, and was just selling his stuff. So literally, <laughs> he rented a uh, a retail space uh, and bought a bunch of tables from Costco 
and just lined up parts on a table. No pricing, <laughs> no nothing. A lot of the pieces, PCs were still together and you could pick parts out of them and you could go up and buy nice. the parts. And so yeah. you'd walk up and you'd go, hey, I found you know this these two sticks of RAM. What do you want for those? And he goes, oh, seven bucks. <laughs> it was just like, whatever I feel like that day. Everything was negotiable. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's how I put together my first PC. <laughs> I did that. When I was at, when I was in high school, I had uh, I was in this uh, tech sport class, and when stuff would go into the trash, the teacher would turn a blind eye if we wanted to put it into our car. Uh-huh. And um, and when uh, the school district upgraded, they upgraded a bunch of stuff. And one of the times they upgraded from like CRTs to you know flat screens, and I took all the CRTs home. <laughs> And I put them on Craigslist for like five bucks a piece and I kitted it out. I was like, look, this is everything you need for like a, you know, an office setup or whatever. <laughs> and uh, had all this extra junk that people could pick from. But I ended I would, I, I sold like little crappy office PC setups with CRT monitors. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, that was so funny to think about. Uh, good times. Anyways. Anyway, uh, that's that's you know that's Intel, baby. <laughs> yeah, we'll go and skip the next story for now. I wasn't sure if we'll talk about it. We might circle back to that with a little more alcohol, and we'll get political. Uh, <laughs> You're not ready. <laughs> I don't think I'm ready. This hazy IPA isn't nearly strong enough to, to dive into that one quite yet. Although I have some some thoughts and opinions. Get another beer if you want. <laughs> uh, oh. I... Not only do I have stout on the table, I have backup stout on the table. So, <laughs> just in case let's I... come back to it. The night yeah, is we'll, young. We'll circle back. Uh, hackers reportedly steal 189 gigabytes uh, of data from Epic Games. Kind of a big deal. Uh, if this turns out to be true, uh, so ransomware group uh, Moglovich. Uh, claims that it hacked into Epic Develop or Epic Games and sold 189 gigabytes of data, comprised of quote emails, passwords, full names, payment information, source code, and more. Um, the exact quote was: "We have carried out an attack against Epic Games servers. If you are an employee of the company or someone who would like to buy this data, click on me, referencing a hyperlink to a site that takes you to the group's contact page." Um, so literally a professional in it for the money hacker, uh, group, uh, called Moglovich is holding this for ransom. Uh, they're allegedly asking $15,000, which seems awful low for that much data. 15,000 goes a long, long ways in other places in the world. Yeah, uh, especially because Moglovich themselves previously has hacked Nissan, uh, specifically Infinity USA, uh, Bizarro Voice, and Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs, and has asked up to $2 million in ransoms for those companies' data. But for some reason with Epic Games, they said, yeah, $15,000. That that seems like... Uh, you, you, might have missed a couple of zeros in that number. Maybe just, they just really love Fortnite. They know? just might really like Fortnite. Um, They're like, hey, big fan of your work. All right, go ahead and give us the... <laughs> but the story gets more interesting. As uh, yesterday, or early this morning, uh, uh, the gamer uh, posted an update in which they got a statement from Epic Games about the hack. Uh, and the update says, Epic Games told the gamer, we are investigating, but there is currently zero evidence that these claims are legitimate. <laughs> Moglovich has not contacted Epic or provided any proof of the veracity of these allegations. When we saw these allegations, uh, which were a screenshot of a dark web web page in a tweet from a third party, very reliable source, uh, we began investigating within minutes and reached out to Moglovich for proof. Moglovich has not responded. The closest thing we have seen to a response is a tweet where they allegedly asked for $15,000 and proof of funds to hand over the purported data. Um, this feels this like... This opens up so many questions for me. <laughs> like, 
I'm like, first of all, how, how do they prove? Okay, so, I mean, could theoretically just anybody just jump online and be like, haha, Maglovich has stolen your data. Hey, me, Maglovich. Yes, you could. Um, here's the deal is the way a lot of these ransomware and hacker groups work though, is when asked for proof, they will send over a couple of source code files right. that yeah. have not been publicly revealed. And they go, okay, well, if they have these, they probably have the rest, it's legit. That's black hat hacking 101, is you need to back up the veracity of your claims. Moglovich has not replied or backed up the veracity of their claims uh, outside of, we have your stuff. Um, they're only asking $15,000, which feels really low based on previous $2 million ransoms that have been uh, asked for for similar troves of data. Um, and... Uh, the, the fact that Epic Games said in a statement, uh, we immediately started investigating, but there is currently zero evidence that these claims are legitimate. What that means is we checked firewalls, egress data, even just access permissions. Not a No users access that data via our logs. Our firewalls don't say that that data exfiltrated, nor did we see that amount of traffic for that amount of time go to a single point or even like a, you know, a botnet style thing where, you know, thousands of PCs are accessing the same folder at the same time. Like there are tells that, that when you get into, uh, uh, evidence, CSI, blah, investigations of, of this kind of nature, you look for that, that kind of data. 189 gigabytes doesn't just vanish into the ether. It's got to come from somewhere and then go to somewhere. And if they don't see 189 gigabytes going to a single IP or a group of IPs or the access logs don't say anything or... <laughs> and the hacker group can't provide source files, evidence files, you know, hey, here's here's two files that I shouldn't have access to. It's probably not legit. <laughs> <laughs> Hard drive got swapped out. Um, yeah, also not thought. likely. Maybe, maybe a flash drive walked out the front door or something, but... Right. But even then, access... Most companies at, at like source code level uh, have access logs um, for who accessed this file, for why. There, there are access restrictions on everything. Nothing about this seems above bore. Like, like no, none of this passes the sniff test for me. And I'm not even in digital forensics. Forensics, that's what I was, the word I was trying to think of. Investigation, CSI, forensics, uh, data, data forensics. None of this passes the sniff test, and that's even for me, who is a complete novice at at this type of work. I pay people to do this type of work when I had to do it. Uh, no one Seems has like all the a source good business. code split up over Teams. Yeah, no one has all the source code split up over Teams, says Michael. Boy, if I wish that were the case in most places. <laughs> Seems like a good shtick. Yeah, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start sending emails to YouTube channels. <laughs> this is a game company. You don't think they encrypt most of their important source code? They probably don't. Encryption takes hardware. Hardware takes money. You got to imagine, too. I mean, one of the funniest things about any security is. Um, the level of convenience, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I can't tell you the number of times that I've, you know, this this isn't necessarily tech related, but you get to a right. place that's uh, 
has a code on the door mm-hmm. or a machine has a code and you literally just try one two three four or zero 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 or another one is like all four corners all four corners um <laughs> get onto google like, find find out what year the company was founded that's another one that's always mm, used that's smart yeah yep um yeah and it's and it's it's wild to me because it's like i've even had that like go to um yeah it's just bizarre and and that that's not uncommon no anytime i've had to do something like that it's like i'm i'm going to 85% of the time it's still the generic code they never bothered changing it um and i guarantee you whoever installed it or whoever received it installed and was given instructions on how to change these passwords they go well i can do that anytime why do i need to do that right now and then 12 years goes by <laughs> right it's the same thing with with any any security mhm if you aren't going to go out of your way to do it to implement it day 1 Yep. It's never going to be implemented, you know? Yep. A company I, epic size, you have a lot of momentum. Mm-hmm. I, I I mean, sticking with the, the theme of physical security, I've talked to numerous companies about integrating access control and why it's probably not a good idea for their organization. Look, I'm happy to sell you the system. I'm happy to install it. But what problem are you trying to solve? And if you're not going to implement those policies uh, that are required for access control to actually work you're going to throw money away. And what I mean by that is uh, I've spoken to some large organizations, uh, you know, buildings with like 50 and 60 exits that they need to secure. And uh, some of these are publicly accessible. Some of them are open on the weekends. They have keys that they hand out to organizations that would rent facilities and whatnot. And uh, if your entire organization can be thwarted by someone putting a towel in a door, and you don't have internal policies for remediation for that employee or that worker or that volunteer, um, then your system is doomed to fail from the get-go, no matter how much technology I throw at it. I could put door sensors on that alert you if the if a door is cracked open or open for too long. If no one gets that alert, then it doesn't matter if there's an alarm on it. If- but not only that, that alert would go off and they would just figure out how to make it not go off. Also correct, yeah. They'd be like, this happens too often. How do we disable it? <laughs> and and the, the other thing is, um, we would catch employees breaking policy and then go, if, if, you, if you are serious about this, your policy needs to have teeth and then you need to exercise them. That means if you reprimand an employee seven times for putting a towel into a door or leaving a door open or have, you know, giving their key away to someone who's not authorized to it or whatever else that employee needs to be gone. You're like, Oh, but they're a really good worker. Oh, well then what are you paying me for? Right. Uh, look, I, 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 I don't say people deserve to be fired, but after seven times of, of oh, yeah. b- correction, a head needs to roll. <laughs> Nothing says obey me like a bloody head on a fence post. Or or so. just or just admit that those policies don't mean anything to you. Exactly. You know, and and that's the thing. Like uh, I just got done doing a short term contract at a at a facility where uh, every door in the building was controlled with a key card. Mm-hmm. There was about half of the doors. If they also had key pads, in addition to the key cards, now you could get anywhere in the entire building just with key pads. Mm-hmm. Every keypad had the same code, and every keypad had a generic code. So it didn't matter. People forgot their badges every single day. There was people, and and there's supposed to be no tailgating. If you are going into a door behind somebody, you're supposed to swipe your card mm-hmm. and all this type of stuff. About fifty percent of the employees I knew never had a key card on them. Yep. And it didn't matter because they could get anywhere they needed to by going and using a keypad with a generic code. Mm-hmm. And I remember right, just writing coattails is is used by so many people to get into buildings they're not supposed to be in. Yeah, and I actually got uh, talked to for telling people they couldn't tailgate me. I was like, this is literally in the handbook. Yeah, it says no tailgating. 
They're like, yeah, well, you know, we just we're trying to get. We don't want to slow done. anyone down. Yeah, ex- and and seriously, and I was like, okay, fine. Yep. It's your 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 stuff to deal with, I guess. But yep. maybe you should uh, consider. I don't know, editing your handbook. <laughs> just say tailgating is cool and easy and chill and normal. Why hand out badges? <laughs> right. Like, I don't know. It just always blew my mind how little it meant. If your access control is nothing more than a mild deterrent and an annoyance, you're doing access control wrong. Yeah. And yeah, as as forgiving and and open of of an employer as I always was when when I was in management and 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 upper management and and things like that, um, there were also things that were non negotiable and the heads would roll for. (laughs) So. I will give you all the leeway in the world as a person. I will give you no leeway when it comes to the security of the company. <laughs> you know, I, I used to work at this. To be. I used to work at this one place that had real, real tight informational security, right? But you knock on the door long enough, and a four-year-old's going to open it and invite you in. <laughs> that, that was your place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that dude was a hard ass, but. <laughs> But now you don't even have to work at a place to ride coattails in. Uh, What you do is you observe for like five minutes and you find out which door people walk outside so they can have their smoke break. You wait until no one's there. You walk over with a cigarette as if you belong there. And then when someone goes to walk, when someone comes out, you know, strike up a conversation, whatever else. Oh, shit, I left my key. I I got you, son. They'll open the door for you because humans want to be (laughs) helpful. Classic. Or just have your hands full. Yeah. Hold the door. <laughs> hold on, hold on. A big empty box can get you lots and lots of places. Yep. <laughs> uh, speaking of the places I don't want to go, uh, yeah. this was so great. This um, is a... <laughs> everyone's talking about this. I kind of want to want to talk about it from the, the perspective of no, the advertising don't. that was used. Don't do it. I kind of want to because, you know, there's been a lot of the overpromise, underdeliver uh, aspect of this, but this is going to be more prevalent uh, in in years to come. Uh, even just think product advertising. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, Firefest for Children. I'm sorry, uh, the Willy Wonka <laughs> experience in Glasgow. Um, and that is uh, is Rambo knocking on the door, Craft? No, Rambo's not knocking on the door. Uh, the Willy Wonka experience in Glasgow. Uh, you see the image on the left, which is the advertising that was promised. This is the image that sold people on $50 a head tickets. And the image on the right, boy, that's even one of the better images that you could possibly represent this whole fiasco with. Yeah. Um, so let's see if Twitter will let me view multi. No, of course not. Uh, oh, wow. Is that a broken window in the background? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Um, so they were told they would get, it was supposed to be a, uh, ex- Willy Wonka themed. Willy Wonka themed, but experience the the wonders of chocolate and uh, was kind of the the main thing of it. Yeah. Was uh, we'll we'll take you through a history of chocolate and the wonders of of this this wonderful food and uh, you know come with me and you, like it was the whole yeah. whole song and dance on the advertisement. People showed up. There wasn't even any chocolate there. Like the whole selling so, point was come try chocolate from around the world. <laughs> I didn't read the story, but the thing that always made me laugh was every single like write up that I read about it mentioned that kids were literally in tears when they left. <laughs> yeah. The police were called. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, it gets better and better the more you read about it. Uh, probably the, the funniest one um, was... Did you see the picture of the Oompa Loompa? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, if you haven't seen what we're talking about, hold on. It's, it's so unreal. It's so unreal. <laughs> there we go. I, got, I found it. This is painful. So, you know, you know what what we were promised, you know, Willy Wonka in a land of, of lollipops and chocolate and everything else. Uh, what we got... <laughs> it's like was Meth this. Lab Barbie. It was meth, meth Lab Oompa Loompa Barbie. <laughs> it's so painful. Uh, uh, according to Popgrave, a Willy Wonka immersive experience that promised to transport fans into a magical realm left kids in tears. The event turned out to be such a letdown that customers called police and compared the attraction to a meth lab. It was literally an empty warehouse. <laughs> I don't know where they bought this kit from, but that's it. There, there's a friggin' toilet brush on the side. Is that what that is? It's, it's either a toilet brush or a bottle brush. <sighs> I don't know. They're playing too much Oblivion. Yeah. But yeah, th oh this, my God. this was it. This was the event in its entirety. So I want to hear what you have to say on behalf of the advertisers. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is, is again, the disparity of what was promised versus what was right. delivered. And we all, I think, I think get, looking at the pictures, a lot of people could tell... We didn't, we haven't mentioned it yet, but the, a lot of those pictures were AI mock-ups. They were all AI mock-ups, uh, right. down to the Willy Wonka. It was the Willy Wonka experience. What are the tells of AI? Uh, two yeah, very non-symmetrical eyes and fingers that are odd. Uh, let's just say the fingers I mean, were a little weird. You would be literally be better off to just take that background and Photoshop an image of Willy Wonka into the freaking thing. Right. It's not hard to do. Right. Okay, whatever. But anyway. It's a wonderful background. Or they actually had actors that were dressed up and the costumes were pretty nice. Just take photos of your actors. Right. Yeah. Um, and I saw too that even like the scripts that the actors had to follow were AI were generated AI -generated. scripts. Um, now, the funny thing is, apparently, the guy who put this all together, the story gets way deeper because he is someone who no. is known to have produced AI generative books and crap stuff, books right? yeah. and sell them yeah, yeah. for dirt cheap on Amazon. Um, and uh, so it should be no shock that the scripts that the actors were given were completely AI, AI generated. Uh, but, uh, no, the, the pictures are just, they're just awful. They're so bad. This is a problem that I've been running into a lot lately. And, oh my God. <laughs> right? You, you recall, and maybe some of our regulars in the chat recall, my tiger sweater incident tiger sweater incident oh yes yes <sighs> fighting the urge to go upstairs and get the damn thing but i bought a sweater based on an image i saw online mm -hmm. and after the sweater was delivered to me the best i could tell is that this cheap website sprung up with a bunch of ai generated images sold a bunch of product that they didn't actually have and then manufactured the closest approximation that they could. Yeah. Because the shirt that I got and I order from a bunch of shady Chinese websites all the time because they it's like they promise cool clothes and I have gotten them every single time except for this one. And I will say that the picture itself oversold. Like I knew it was overselling. Yeah. But I thought to myself, if I get half of what it's promising, I'm in, I'm striking gold. I didn't even get ten percent. Yeah, for, for those uh, for those who are wondering, um so Rhett was sold on a uh what looked like like a three D stitched embroidered it tiger looked like shirt. It, yeah. It looked sweater. like it had like literal like embroidered like 
flowers in this like knitted sweater Mm -hmm. and i thought to myself if the sweater is even if the flowers are bullshit and the sweater is this texture and this type of whatever that's still gold yeah uh and the and the tiger the tiger looks completely ridiculous but i you know i bought weird shirts before man lots and lots of weird sweaters you've seen them yep and uh and this one i just kept thinking like well if it's like you could tell that it was just it, it was being oversold but okay if it's a fraction and it was a fraction but way lower than it should have been and because yeah. everything nothing was like like jeff said it was it kind of had this like 3d sort of depiction of the picture no yep. completely flat uh it looked like a tiger on this image and the thing i got looked like maybe a cougar uh it had all of these like three-dimensional flowers that were like stitched on it looked like fabric flowers stitched onto the sweater but they were literally just crappy uh, it was a it was like a crappy fabric iron-on. design yeah yeah it, yeah it was like it was like literally something i could go down to my variety store and buy a fabric pattern of yeah uh it wasn't well made it wasn't a good fit it the colors didn't match even in the slightest nothing was accurate about this yeah and the best I could tell, all AI images on the website. I went back and looked. All of them had to have been AI images. Yeah. Um, and they were good. They looked really appealing. And then I'm like, and that explains why they could sell them at such a low price. And then they would just manufacture the crappiest thing that they could and ship it. And ever since then, I've been hyper aware of this because I've, I've been getting ads for like kids toys. Mm-hmm. And you look at the ad, you look at the image of these kids' toys, and you're like, "Man, that's a cool toy." But then you get to realizing, like, "Oh, that's not even a real image." That's oh god, I hadn't even that's seen like this. I saw an hold on, hold I on. saw an ad. Ooh, no, had... no, 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 <laughs> no. What? <laughs> that's horrifying. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> So the costume uh, on, on Wonka isn't half bad. But what the hell's with this dude? The Grim Reaper, bro. And what is he hiding behind? Is that a mirror? It's a mirror. It's like a, a wardrobe mirror. God, dude. What the heck? I like how I describe my sweater and Cosworth is like, yo, tell me you're from Portland without telling me you're from Portland. <laughs> The truth is, I like wacky sweaters, and when I was going into craft studios every day, I had a good excuse to wear them, um, because I didn't have to, you know, wear a tie. (laughs) So, but... um, That's why I wore polos. Right, yeah, it's, exactly, it's like a halfway point, you know? But man, this AI shit, it's everywhere. That's the point I was trying to get to. It's yeah. everywhere. I've been seeing it in, in ads for kids' toys. I've been seeing it for all this. And you know, like, have you... You probably saw this on Twitter or one of one of those social media sites where um, all of the item descriptions were like a chat GPT error. Yep. <laughs> they didn't even check it. It was just an it error. It was a that small they language and- model. <laughs> And they just copied and pasted it in there. And it was like, holy crap, man. It is everywhere. And now I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm watching shows on Netflix with subtitles on with so many errors. I can't help but think that it's AI generated. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do research for like a craft extra script that I want to write. I'm, or I'm trying to do research... For something else that I got to do. And a lot of the results that I'm reading on the front page of Google seem... I'm getting entire web pages that seem to be generated based off of my search. Based off of what I typed into Google. And so it's crazy to me. I still don't know what you're going to say about on the advertiser's behalf. Because I see this and it's like, I get it to a degree... No, it, my my point was exactly what you've been stating is do you see the layoffs that are happening across technology where oh, yeah. the CEOs are chasing 
that that nth degree of productivity and they go, oh, well, if AI can do the work of 20 people, let's fire these 20 people and fire up one AI. Um, it's going to be then- a thing that in two to three years, tech companies have to go back and hire all the people that they just fired uh, because... AI is not capable of doing these jobs. AI is not capable of programming. AI is... uh, It can spit out a code with relative accuracy as far as, like, simple functions. What it's not going to be able to do is troubleshoot said code. It's not going to be able to... There there are some things that AI, and I've said this before, can be a jumping off point. Yeah. to, To a creative, to a technical aspect, to a... For many, many different aspects. What it can't do is replace the human yet. No. I, there seems to be a lot of value for people like you and I, probably a lot of people in chat, as something of a small, minor touchstone for projects. Not somebody that's, not something that's driving, not something that's making decisions, but a small touchstone that if you want to bounce something off of it, if you want to check something with it, we're not, we're not talking facts. We're not talking big decisions. We're not talking. Any, it makes a very good touchstone type assistant. Yeah. But the problem is this for people like you and I, Jeff, we see and we can implement it in a value add type of way. Mm hmm. The way a CEO sees it is a cost-saving measure. Yes. And there's a huge freaking difference. Yep. The things that I use it for are not going to impact the final product. It's not going to be in the product that I deliver a client. Right. But CEOs don't see it that way shareholders don't see it that way it's a race to the bottom like you said this thing can do the work of 20 people well we better fire 20 people i don't know i don't even know what else to say about it at this point because because i think all of us tech enthusiasts in chat we we see this and we think of all the good things that can be done with it and none of those things are what a CEO is going to do. None of those things are what shareholders are going to vote for. Yeah. None of those things. Uh, and and all of the things that CEOs and shareholders are going to do with it are the things that are going to drive the development path of that product. We've gotten I mean, it's so hilarious. short-sighted because of the shareholder market. No it one... has been savage these yeah. last 10 years yeah. like since i don't i don't know when this started 2016 2017 it has been gut-wrenching watching this whole shareholder thing i mean it's it's an absolute race to the bottom yep. how can what types of lies can you tell or truths can you stretch yep to make your red line on wall street go up so well, that you can earlier today uh ea announced they're laying off 5% of their staff. Yeah. Uh, And in the statement, they said, this greater focus allows us to drive creativity, accelerate innovation, and double down on our biggest opportunities. No, it doesn't. Reducing your creative workforce does not accelerate innovation or drive creativity. (laughs) It does kind of the opposite. It saves you money. But it doesn't increase your output. And even then, I want to see. I want to see like the real figures on this, like the uh, the unencumbered truth on the uh, on those figures. Because I think I talked about this last time. One of the funny things about CES this year was how hyper focused it was on AI. Mm-hmm. And I and some of these tech. It's like RGB, but sad. <laughs> yeah, you know. And some of these these startup CEO type figures, they had nothing but positives to say. And when confronted with questions of potential drawbacks or potential costs, potential negatives, 
they didn't have answers. Mm-hmm. And that, that's kind of why I was saying earlier, like watching Gelsinger talk and give real answers to real engineering questions was like really refreshing because I'm fresh off this train of seeing a lot of the things that people in CES are saying. And I talked about this last time I was on the show, but yeah, yeah. But one of the prime examples was these the the startup CEO talking about, well, our clients who are fighting fraud, they say that they can replace that that this AI platform is the equivalent of one million workers in fighting this fraudulent activity. And somebody goes up and is like, well, is it possible that the that the fraudsters are using this AI technology and that there's really no like benefit? It's all a wash. Mm-hmm. You actually don't have any gains. <laughs> it's a complete status quo situation. And he had no answer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, whatever because... tools you're trying to utilize to fight this, they're going to be using and utilizing to try to gain an advantage over whatever system you have. And if you're running the same LLM or the same algorithms or the same whatever else for AI to detect fraud that the fraudsters are using to commit fraud. It's not necessarily a value add. I mean, are are you on Twitter anymore? I mean, at all? Like Not not really. I occasionally, because it's logged in on my desktop, the opportunity I get to work from my desktop, I'll log in and look. Mm-hmm. And it is staggering how many comments on a given post seem to be AI generated posts. I they all are the same. They're all identical. I I, like I left I left for two reasons. Uh basically the, the end was near uh, of of Twitter and and you know <laughs> oh but Elon brought back free speech. No, he oh, brought for... back Nazis. Uh like let's let's call hate mongers what they are, okay? Uh number 2 is for a long time now. In fact, I just logged back in uh, or just opened it back up <laughs> on my desktop. Um, probably 10% of my new follows are all from, like, yes. From the image. I don't even have to, from the yes. little tiny thumbnail that like they're so-and-so like liked your comment. You know they're a bot. You know yeah. they're a catfish. You know what, 10%. I'm looking I, down I, I, here of the 15 notifications that I had. No, sorry. One, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have 10 notifications and there's probably 15 to 17 individual thumbnails. I can see three that I know are bots or catfishes. It's not a great percentage to have on a platform. I stopped logging in. I stopped being active. And every once in a while, I'd log in from, or you know, because my desktop is logged in and I would check it. You know, just because I do have contacts there that aren't on other platforms. Mm-hmm. And I would have 15 notifications or 15, hey, this person's now following you, for example. And I would look all, you know, fembot, adult, sort of like, hey, follow my OnlyFans or follow this, whatever. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's gone to shit and all so many times you can reply look at a news story and I'll, there's been I don't even big... mind I don't even mind the creators the OnlyFans creators who are on there to promote their OnlyFans and are trying to engage with people yeah. and, and you click on their bio and they go oh link to my OnlyFans that's fine whatever I literally yeah. do the same thing yeah 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 it's why no, I I'm engage not... with a lot of people the I'm not problem judging the content. is the problem is they're not even real people anymore yeah <laughs> and and that's exactly what I'm getting to. And 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 any of the any of the major things that you're interacting with on, I mean, oh my god, almost any single blue check post on Twitter anymore seems to be AI generated. It seems to be AI yeah. generated. If there is a response to a big tweet that has a lot of traction, you can read like a dozen blue check comments in a row. They're all like derivatives of the same thing. One sentence response with just a few changes to the sentence. Yeah. Yep. And, um, God, where the hell was I going with all this? There was a point why I brought up Twitter earlier, but it's all trash, man. And, and you know, the thing that made me skeptical of it in the first place is the same thing that made me skeptical. Uh, oh, it's the same reason why I didn't buy any freaking board eight, you know, NFT tokens or whatever. It's like, 
Well, there's uh, a number of reasons why I didn't buy those. But, but it's like the, these people all Aren't sound you the same. Yeah. They all sound the same, and they seem to be, like, trying to do the same thing. And, like, one of the real sad things, obviously, and we kind of talked about this when we did the video on, um, you know, the, the generative AI the stable diffusion when we when we did the video on stable diffusion it's like we kind of touched on this a little bit it's like the saddest thing to me is that the first thing they go after are the things that don't need to be ai generated but it's also that they could generate content to upload it to amazon uh to amazon publishing or or whatever have you and what's crazy to me about these freaking ai like books on the kindle store for example Mm -hmm. is they're all derivative trash none of them are inspired they all suck and then you have like a thousand derivative ai reviews of them mm -hmm. that are all the same thing and you gotta wonder to yourself okay like is there a whole ai encircled self-contained like little economy happening i mean you see the joke sometimes where ais are interacting with each other on twitter but what about the content that they're pumping out for people? That Are that they... happened. Uh, there's actually a, a YouTube parallel insane. with that, um, in which uh, Crypto Bros. I mean, what happens yeah. when a YouTube channel gets taken over? All of a sudden, you get a stream of Elon Musk saying, "Invest in this particular crypto." Like, and it's the same stream and the same logos and the same everything else every single yeah. time. Um, what was funny is we still experience this a bit on YouTube. Is uh, comments that will someone will start a stream and go like wow i can't believe you you uh you said all these delivered things this so concisely yeah you, you delivered <laughs> this so concisely almost as concisely as as my financial advisor blah 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 did and that oh you work with financial advisor blah 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 yeah i totally work with financial advisor blah 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 you can check them out by by googling yeah. financial advisor blah 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 no way financial advisor blah 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 completely changed my life I'll get strings of comments like that uh, yeah. that are all just, the they all get posted within 15 seconds of each other. And it's a string of source and thread. And, and that's um, the exact type of behavior that I'm talking about. It just makes yeah. the internet an insufferable place to be. It's, you know, the worst thing that <laughs> happened to the internet was, I don't know. I, uh, okay, I'm. Uh, by the way, Terrapup sends over five dollars. I'm late today. Is this talking about Elon launching X Mail or something else? <laughs> <laughs> You're so freaking close. That's really funny. Uh, and there's, and of course, you saw the stories about how like the tunnel in Las Vegas is like leaching toxic sludge that like leaves irreparable burns on people, and like, uh -huh. and then like every other day, there's a story about the Cybertruck just being a god awful piece of shit. Like, <laughs> just like it's just never ending and yep. it's not just elon it really is encapsulated by a lot of these like tech bro personality types yep. but ai is like one of the biggest ones and 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 it's like what was the how much money did this person do this wonka thing Th this is what this is all about how much money yeah. did this wonka person make how much i mean you gotta you gotta wonder are are refunds not incoming i mean how do they sell their tickets? Uh, are refunds not a part of that? Because it, it was basically forty bucks a head, and it made big enough news to let's say two hundred people attended. Two hundred people at forty bucks a head is a good amount of money. Yeah, and there's not a soul alive that would look at this and say that that's not false advertising right and everybody in chat we can look at these images we're all we're all savvy enough we know when we're looking at an ai generated image at least for now right but that's not the case everywhere and when you have kids a major side effect of that is that you lose a little bit of time to be as discerning as you might otherwise have been when you have kids, you you become less of a discerning consumer. Not always, but oftentimes, especially for things like this. Yeah. Get out of the house stuff. Yeah. 
you're you're gonna buy tickets. That sounds fun. I'll go have a couple of pieces of chocolate. Let the kids run around, uh, you know, eating candy and playing little games and things like. Yeah, yeah, sure. That sounds like I liked Willy Wonka when I was a kid. Yeah, why not? Yeah, because the model for the last 50, 60, 70 years of doing kids shit is not getting ripped off by crap images. You could walk by the carnival out front of your local grocery store and tell that it sucked and not go in. You know, it's like, but now. You ever been, I I know you have been. (laughs) You ever been driving somewhere really late at night? You arrive like eight hours after you thought you'd be there and you pull up and you go, well, I'm not staying at that hotel. (laughs) I'm just saying. Uh, Yeah. Usually I will sleep in my car. (laughs) You know, Jeff, I have, um, (laughs) I've been in that situation many times and I always (laughs) sleep in the hotel. (laughs) Uh, that's why I like sometimes, you, right? you. You're a man of simple taste. <laughs> sometimes I sleep on the bed without undoing the covers, and I keep my shoes on. But <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> or maybe I sleep in the nearby armchair. Uh, I like Rainier, and I'm not afraid of scurvy. That's what I like about you, Rhett. Uh, we do have a couple super yeah. chats rolling in. Uh, Green sends over five dollars. Thank you very much. Elon fought censorship while simultaneously algorithmically burying you uh, or blocking opposition to his views and posts. Yeah, something something free speech is free speech for me, not for thee. Uh, it's also one of the big reasons I left the platform. Was yeah. I'm pretty outspoken as people are people. Let's treat people like people. And when all of a sudden there's an influx Whoa. of people who don't like treating people like people, I have a serious problem. Let's let's not get political about this, okay? I'm, hey, Nazis are people too, right? So no, no, <laughs> they're not. Yeah, the seriously, only, it's crazy. The only thing, um, go on. Gosh, how do I put this into in, into proper phrase? into woke terms, Jeff? No, wow, no, not even okay. That. Wow, I didn't um, know that we were that type of podcast, but okay. Christopher Titus. Christopher Titus has a great routine about uh, <laughs> uh, getting divorced from his wife. And uh, he says, uh, he shows up in court and he goes, this this woman cheated on me and she lied to my kids and she everything else. And his wife gets on gets on the stand and says, your honor, this man has beaten me and my children every day since, since I first met him. And uh, apparently, nuh-uh, is not a defense in California court. He goes, no, I never, never laid a hand on my wife. I never did anything. And the only thing that ever made me want to be a wife beater is being called one. <laughs> Your Honor, can I have five minutes to make her not a liar, please? It's a great routine. Um, the only thing that turns me into a judgmental, hateful, literally would want to murder someone is when you feel that way about a certain race or orientation of people. That's the only people I am hateful towards is those who are so judgmental and awful that they wish harm on others. Well, that's that's the whole thing too about like the the, the tolerance paradox, right? And, mm-hmm. and uh, you You're hear so it screeched. Jeff. Yeah, you hear it screech from the other side as though like mm-hmm. as though you're not capable of discerning the exceptions to any given situation and that's one of them right you you can't you can't tolerate intolerance and even if that means that you're nope no nobody's perfect yeah and uh and that platform man it went to shit so quick like you said the nazis moved in so fast um it went from me constantly it's not even just like the you know I'm not even talking political. I'm I'm simply talking, you know, the the anti-trans, the anti-pride, the anti, you know, gay move, the you know, the the Black Lives Matter hate, the, the this the that. One group wants equality, treat us like people. The other group wants them to die. Both sides are the <laughs> same, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know, man. Not I'm not convinced. Yeah. Uh, next no, week just, is Mixology March, right? Yes, next week is the start of Mixology March. Uh, Terra Pups having a root beer with Amaretto. I've not had that combo before. 
I do like Amaretto. I do like root beer. Uh, I've done Pepsi and Amaretto. Uh, surprisingly, an underrated one. Uh, seven Up and Amaretto. Give that a whirl. That is a fantastic soda combo. Tech Geek sends out another super chat. Yes. Yep, there you go. Uh, been a while since I caught the show live. Speaking of catching the show live, Tunnel Bear. Uh, I've never worked with Tunnel Bear. Uh, if you're referring to the, the Las Vegas tunnels, the, uh, the Elon Musk tunnels, uh, I don't think Tunnel Bear wants to sponsor them either. <laughs> Not today. Not today. I do have a question for the populace at large. Uh, Let's hear it. I did say I had two stouts on my table. I had primary stout and backup stout. Uh, I would like to open one, and I will I will put this up. These are essentially equals. We have Crux gotta, Fermentation, yeah. Tough Love, Barrel-Aged Imperial Stout, 14% Wax Seal Top, delicious Barrel-Aged Series every single year. Uh, on the other hand, we have a... Uh, Ghost 1073, a collaboration between Adroit Theory and Decibel Magazine. Uh, the extremely oh. extreme Russian Imperial Stout, also clocking in at 14%. Um, well, I was going to say Crux just because keep it local, right? But Adroit Theory, they don't really miss. Well... They take some they take some chances, but they don't miss often, you know what I'm saying? So Ooh, we're 50-50 just four votes in. It's got it's gone two and two. Glass bottle to saver now, metal can for when your taste buds have a bias. That's not a bad way to go. Although it's not just just glass, it is wax sealed too. So this one is made to be stored a while. Um, if size doesn't matter, Adroit, uh, they're both 14%. They're both 16 ounce. Well, one's 500 mil, so it's 16.9. Um, Adroit's fantastic. Gosh, you guys are still like 50, 50. <laughs> um, go with the can, go with the can, go with the can. Yeah. I'm gonna go with the can. I'm going to go Adroit. Uh, Yeah. We're, go we're going to go Adroit Theory. Adroit Theory, Decibel Magazine Brewing, extremely extreme Russian Imperial. It's got the heavy the heavy metal font, you know? Yes. <laughs> what year of Tough Love? Uh, 2023. Uh, I bought this bottle a month and a half, two months ago. Um, so not, not well aged yet. Uh, I did open my second drink as well. And it's a, uh, a Zevia uh, Pop. A oh, root beer. There you go. Uh, if you guys haven't had these Zevia Pops, they're really good. They're uh, zero sugar, you know, sweetened with stevia plant. And uh, the root beer is darn good root beer. And also, I hate nice. grape, but they're, pop, they're grape pop. Very good. Um, and they're ginger ale. Top-notch ginger ale. All zero sugar, sweetened with stevia plant. Uh, you can buy them at Costco. Nice. There you go. Good. Go and also, work. it's it's unsettling drinking a root beer uh, that is clear. So <laughs> <laughs> drink it out they of the also, can. <laughs> yeah, their cola is clear as well. All their pop, all their pops are clear. So yeah. you open a purple can for the grape and you pour it into a glass. And you're like, that's clear. I don't like that. <laughs> uh, uncomfortable. But I'm sure it's better for you too. You know, like other, without all those colors, I don't really know to be honest, but. Yeah. I don't drink much pop, but these have been uh, helping me get through some long days. Yes. Uh, anyway, we do have some other news to get to. Uh, hey. Star Citizen developer CIG, Cloud Imperium Gaming. I uh, didn't think we'd be talking about this uh, so quickly. They're releasing. Doubtful. No, I lie. Uh, they're laying off most of their chief staff. Oh, no. Just like everybody, I in thought the they games were one industry. of the most played games on the internet. What? No, what? I can't believe this completely unsurprising news. Yeah, uh, director, assistant directors, technical directors, art directors, a lot of them are gone. Oh, an ex geez, producer, Rick. An ex-producer of the studio also claims CIG is home to a highly toxic workplace culture. Savasar oh, Citizen, Cloud Imperium Games have reportedly been laid off. 
Uh, these cuts, said ex-turbulent producer Annie Buford, were mass layoffs ex- uh, excused as staff relocation. Um, so uh, they are building a new Manchester, UK studio. Uh, they started building this in 2021. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I forget the whole list, but it was like 17 people. There's only like 100 people that work there, too. Like, CIG is not a huge organization, and they laid off most of the senior staff. So, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm sure. I'm sure Star Citizen's still coming. I'm, still, I'm uh, sure Squad 42. Are you telling me, Rick, that the game that just keeps asking for more money is completely on the up and up and not a toxic place to work. That doesn't make any sense, Rick. How, how could that possibly be? Oh, geez, Morty. If I had, what, $700 million of donations, I'd probably cut the check and run too. But is that really what they did? Perhaps they're just thinking about the health of their company, you know? Maybe this really was dead weight and workers don't actually do anything. Right, Rick? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, don't answer that, Rick. (laughs) I'm not answering that one. Morty, can can we just move on? Oh, geez, Rick. You always take the coward's way out. (laughs) Yeah. Game developers... Not surprising, man. Game developers must be a tough crowd like Blizzard. Yeah. Uh, staff relocation equals we are relocating you from employed to unemployed. Relocated <laughs> to outside the building. Yes. <laughs> relocated to home. Yep. What's funny is last uh, time we talked about Star Citizen and we kind of crapped on it. Uh, we got a couple of very angry comments. Uh, oh, yeah. I saw. They never ended. They kept going. Kept go- They kept going after the show. It's like, come it was, on. It was Just amazing. get a grip. You've been duped. Okay. I'm sorry. You've been duped. I spent money on Star Citizen 2. And you were duped. My $55 (laughs) does not change my personality or my outlook on Star Citizen. It's... My Star Citizen donation predates my starting a YouTube channel. Which is entering its seventh year. I I started a band in 2012 and the lead singer of that band invited me over to show me this game. And that game was Star Citizen. And all he could do was like see his ship docked or whatever. And he could like walk around and look at it docked. And he's like, I've spent $255 on this to get this ship and to be able to look at it. And someday it's going to be like real life but in outer space. And I was like, yeah, but, like, you can do that already in other games, you know? Like, EVE Online is a thing. It's very strong. Yep. There's other games. Elite Dangerous is fantastic. And, you know, granted, this was 12 years ago. I don't know when Elite Dangerous came out, but... Starfield, but, I can build my own ship. Yeah, you know, and that's... The th- I, I I just remember telling him, I was like, 255 bucks, dude, you, you're late on rent this month. And that's the type of people that Starfield attracts mm-hmm. are ones that they're, I don't know, man. It's like, what is it? Because it's not like, it's not like he was like financially irresponsible. Does, does he, he also was, have uh, an ape logo for his uh, profile picture now? I don't know, man. Yeah. I don't think he's on. I think he's like a born again. Does he vouch for Tesla but... without ever owning a Tesla? Does he still drive his Honda Ooh, CRX? He's probably the type of dude that vouches for Tesla and drives his Honda CRX. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I wish I could say I kept in touch with him. I didn't. He was the most annoying member uh, of the band. Uh, nice guy. Really nice guy, but also very annoying. Um, and yeah, anyway, that's that's just the type of person that Star Citizen attracts or these types that it's like, I don't know, it's like this, this you, they, they glean onto the image that investing in something like that gives them. Right? It's like, it's like the image of what having a Tesla gives you, yeah. not what a tesla actually gives you what is what is saying that you bought into star citizen early gain you and uh, they can tell people that they i saw the hype coming before the hype they're they're literally vinyl hipsters yeah 
I don't know. I, I can't wrap my head around it. It's 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 a type of consumer that I'll never be. And so I'll I'll admit I, to a particular I bought Star bias. Citizen before it was cool. Dude, it's not cool now. Well, it's going to yeah. be. Yeah. It's it's rough. I don't know. Star Citizen sucks and screw them for laying off. Oh, you know what? Screw all these people for their tech layoffs, man. It's like you go online, look yeah. anywhere and it's a bunch of incredibly qualified you know and, and and i don't know you look you do look at the numbers and it's like okay they 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 added more games jobs than ever when covid hit and these layoffs are just a fraction of that but it's like is the games industry really that unhealthy you know we're all buying games still come on get a grip well we're all buying pal world still <laughs> I don't know about you. That's where most of my money went the last two months. Buying. A I do see you logging World into for, it a lot. <laughs> buying a copy of Pal World for every person in my family. It adds up. <laughs> uh, to be fair, only about half the time do you see me on Pal World. Am I actually on Pal World? It's actually one of my kids on playing on my account. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, how is he putting out videos? This guy's playing Pal World all the time. <laughs> When you see me from like 7.30 to 9 in the morning, that's me playing Power World. <laughs> if you see me any other time, it's not me. <laughs> it's the imposter, Jeff. <laughs> uh, speaking of the imposter, Nintendo laying down some smack. Um, uh, Nintendo, in a lawsuit against the Yuzu emulator which is a Switch emulator, uh, is basically taking the position that emulation itself is unlawful, which is a position that they have not taken to court before. This is, uh, this is a little bit more than we're taking a specific individual to court for their actions that have monetarily damaged us. Um, emulation, in and of itself is not illegal under certain standards. If an emulator is built without access to any proprietary information, any first party information of the functioning of the console. Uh, so let's, let's talk SNES. Uh, if, if an SNES emulator is built without any first party knowledge of how the code for the SNES actually is written and you reverse engineer and can get SNES software running on not SNES hardware. That's actually totally legal. Uh, decompiling reverse engineering is not a crime. Um, there are stipulations in the DMCA for times in which transferring media from one licensed form to an unlicensed form is within your use case. Uh, it goes all the way back to VHS and time shifting days. Uh, this program broadcast on the TV at 8 p.m., but I wasn't awake at 8 p.m., so I set my VCR to record this program at 8 p.m., but either that program was broadcast over the air or I pay for a subscription to that service and I'm guaranteed the opportunity to view it, I am time shifting my license to be able to view it at a later date. That's a totally legitimate use case of recording and viewing later outside of a broadcaster's intent. Uh, same thing with cassettes, same thing with a lot of different media. There's been arguments that have been levied in court, and by the way, I am not a lawyer, of media shifting, media transferring, license transferring. Well, I bought a CD, but I have an iPod. Am I allowed to play my music on my iPod? Yes, you are. You're allowed to transfer your use of the CD to a digital file that you create that you can use on other playback. You can use other playback methods for. Um, logic dictates that if I buy a copy of, let's say, Tears of the Kingdom, I don't necessarily have to use that license on a Nintendo Switch, on Nintendo hardware, logged into Nintendo servers to play that game. I could, in theory, use that license to play on an emulator. There is a legal case to be made there. Uh, Nintendo is suing Yuzu because it is 
facilitating piracy at a colossal scale. This is going to be a fairly big lawsuit, both for DMCA and for the future of emulation. Nintendo filed this lawsuit because uh, Tears of the Kingdom was leaked early in 2023. Some of you might remember it was leaked almost two and a half weeks before the retail release. Someone ripped the game, made it available as a ROM online, and it was playable uh, in the Yuzu emulator. Yuzu themselves, and here's where they probably might have misstepped here, came out with updates to increase the compatibility of Tears of the Kingdom prior to the retail release of Tears of the Kingdom. Probably a misstep on their part. Uh, the other oh, no. allegation here is the Yuzu emulator contains decryption keys that have been taken from a real Nintendo Switch that are used to decrypt ROMs on the fly. Mm. That's also possibly another major misstep. Uh, now, Nintendo is kind of going scorched earth. Uh, if you read through the legal brief, the, the, the actual complaint uh, against Yuzu, um, they spend, it's like a 70 page complaint. They spend like 20 pages establishing how much money and patting themselves on the back that Tears of the Kingdom and Nintendo as a whole uh, made off their intellectual property in, tw in 2023. That's to establish damages. That's to establish how much money Yuzu is potentially going to be on the hook for. So if it goes to a jury trial or even a settlement offer, hey, look, uh, we're going to charge you 50% of our overall revenue because you hurt our potential sales of this game uh, through illegal piracy. You facilitate piracy. And we can look at other things that you do that are against our, our corporate well-being um for the emulation community this one might sting a bit uh this might be some legal precedent that is going to be set based on this case because again while nintendo is is working within the grounds of the dmca when it comes to protecting their ip protecting uh tears of the kingdom uh, and and their software. They are also going after the hardware emulation and trying to get a legal judgment that hardware emulation is a crime. Yay! Yay. Existing in digital space just keeps getting more and more fun, doesn't it? Yep. Yep. Uh, emulating something that is now end of life or otherwise no longer available, I have no issues with. And actually, there are exceptions within the DMCA that if you purchased uh, software when it was in production and you no longer have your original, so long as you purchase the original, you could download a copy as long as it's not currently for sale in a media that you can afford or at a price that you can afford. So let's say you bought a game for $5 in 1999 and you wanted to replay that game and collectors are selling it for $900 or $9,000 based on whatever the hell the collector's market is doing right now. Um, that's not a feasible price for you to pay for a copy of a game that you already owned at one point. Um, there are actually provisions within the DMCA and exceptions that if you can acquire that through other means, you can play it. Um, there are exceptions for media transfers. There are exceptions for things that can and can't be done uh, within that, that scope. And a lot of them have to do with precedents that were set 20 years ago, like I, like I mentioned, or you know, 40 years ago when it comes to VHS recording. But a lot of those, those provisions would probably transfer forward into current day. Um, again, I'm not a lawyer and... The problem with the DMCA is you're guilty until found innocent uh, on a lot of things because it's up to the corporation to file a complaint against you. And then it's your, the burden of proof is on you 
to claim whether or not your use case is legal. It's the same thing with fair use. If I wanted to include uh, a, a reaction GIF or you know a video clip or something like that in one of my videos, would I be able to argue the fair use of that clip? By the way, that has to happen in a court of law if there's a DMCA complaint lodged against me. I don't necessarily want to pay the court fees to argue that my inclusion of a SpongeBob GIF should be fair use in a YouTube video. So <laughs> that's the problem with a lot of this. The problem with this particular case, we might be getting some solid legal definitions of what is okay as far as media transfer, as far as emulation, as far as a whole bunch of other things, and what is not okay. And I don't think a lot of us want those answers. Especially as the way that Nintendo is probably going to want them defined. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. I knew a guy years ago who um, was a real big music file, and um, he was just super big on exploring the seven seas of the internet and finding and getting whatever music he could get his hands on, but he had been a music file long, long, long before that was an option. Mm -hmm. And his whole uh, moral take on getting a lot of this music was, well, I bought that CD in the 80s, or I bought, you know, I bought that tape whenever, or I had this on vinyl, or whatever, you know, oh, I, 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 I've got the cassette if they come after me, you know, I'm going to show them that I bought it, and this is my legal backup, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a lot of music, he had more music than anybody I ever knew in digital format, and uh, he's just like, Saved all of his receipts, saved all of his, uh, every physical purchase, even if it de deteriorated beyond the use of, of, uh, being functional. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I'd like to see them try to come after me. <laughs> He's like, I have a legal right to back up my stuff. Now, did I back it up before it went kaput? Well, no, but. <laughs> it's like, right. I bought all their stuff once. Sometimes I bought it even twice. Mm -hmm. It's like, I hey, feel. Good for you. I, I am a huge proponent of not only uh, uh, game and digital media preservation. I think that is something right. very important. Uh, in fact, right. we'll get into that story here in just a second. Um, yeah. But uh, but also that at a certain point, works become abandoned. And I'm a huge proponent of abandonware for keeping yeah. some of these things alive. Yeah. Uh, and, and that includes emulated games. That includes SNES games from companies that are 20 years extinct that no one has a legal copyright claim to. Or Look, if, if you're a company and you made Tiny Toons Sports for the SNES and you haven't done anything with that IP for 25 years, nor are you going to do anything with that IP for the next 25 years, I think it's fair game to play that game. You made your money. You made your money. You're not going to make any more money. If you do re-release it, it'll be pennies compared to anything that you could ever bring uh, to the, you know from the original. It's time to let it go. It's time to let it beep in the community and of course we you know we're talking about reasonable stuff too if 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 disney comes out and they're like i want to make the tiny tune sports movie then yeah you should be fairly compensated but like if we're just talking about people playing a copy of your freaking game yeah i don't know man i don't see the hang up but i know that was a very specific example with tiny tune sports but it sounded very bitter. <laughs> like, there is a major personal baggage here. <laughs> I will say, I have ROMs of Final Fantasy 2, Final Fantasy 3 from the SNES from when I was a kid. Um, guess what? I've also bought those titles five times over, including the Pixel remasters. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, including the PSP versions of, of both of those games, including... You've gotten your money from me, Squaresoft, okay? If I want to replay Final Fantasy for the SNES as I originally played it, I should be able to do that. Yeah. And they're like, well, you can, on your cartridge, with your console. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a mess out there. It's crazy to me that we've dreamed up a way of... Um, injecting some level of like artificial scarcity into what amounts to ones and zeros that can be copied and pasted with, you know, a few clicks of a keyboard. <laughs> you know, it's like I think it's actually like, a great point. I, you know, one of the big dreams of like the digital revolution is that like scarcity doesn't exist. You know, mm -hmm. and that's like one of the things that we see. When you watch Star Trek The Next Generation and you see how the replicator works, they're reducing objects that are coming through the replicator, essentially to ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. And they eliminate actual scarcity, not just digital scarcity. They eliminate actual scarcity by allowing these ones and zeros to be copied. And, of course, it, it does cost something, but they have warp energy. Okay, So why would they hold back the number of freaking blankets then you can replicate or the number of bowls of chicken noodle soup that you can replicate it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense that you would limit digital things either and i get you want to make your money and you want to have all that i want to make sure that artists are getting paid i want to make sure that creators are getting paid i want to make sure that uh, square enix can come out with the next final fantasy game because i've enjoyed all the ones that have come before Yep. But there comes a certain point where it is just ones and zeros mm -hmm. and and trying to add some like real marketplace bullshit to it is stupid. You have something that is infinitely replicable and that's cool. Yep. I don't know, man. It's just stupid. Like that there are there are people who argue so based on this scarcity argument there are people that argue that um downloading something is not a crime because if i wasn't going to pay for it anyway then you weren't going to get the money anyway there yeah. are also people that say if it didn't cost you anything for me to download then you didn't lose any money um i beg to differ on that if if we're talking like a new product oh i wanted to make sure it would run on my pc first then read a review I wanted to make sure I would play the game first, then take advantage of Steam's two-hour return. Yeah. Don't justify your piracy on some bullshit excuse. If you're going to pirate a game, just freaking own it, okay? Uh, are there pirates or are there people who will download a, a, a DRM-free cracked version of a game and then they play it so much that they they feel obligated to go purchase it? Sure, I would say 2% of them. The rest of the people are just freaking pirates. So so don't don't sell me on this. Don't your friend might have receipts for 10% of the media that he ever downloaded. I guarantee he doesn't have it for 100%. He's a very special person. He might I don't know if he does, but he could. If somebody did, it would be him. And again, I think there is a moral ground of this thing has existed in pop culture, in in media for so freaking long. It's on every radio station. It, I can turn it on oldies and I guarantee these three songs will play. Um, you should be able to just download those songs. If I can cop, if I can put in a cassette tape and then record it off the radio right now, I should be able to just download the MP3. Like there is a certain moral ground that that kind of makes sense. There is a moral ground that doesn't make sense, though, when uh, a company works on... A great example, today, uh, I think today or yesterday, uh, Dark Forces, the original Dark Forces for PC, got a remaster. Uh, and it's available on Steam. It's like 30 bucks on Steam. In fact, it's in my cart right now. I was going to buy it probably tomorrow. Um, the... Dark Forces for DOS got a complete remaster, ground up, all new textures, complete new animations, retextured sound, a whole bunch of really cool, you know, quality of life improvements. Um, 
Awesome. That's not the original game. You can't say that I paid for the original game so I get the remaster. No, people worked on the remaster. Give the remaster people their money. Like, that's yeah. that's the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. If you want to play the original version of the game, I don't think there's any problem with downloading a game that's literally 30 years old at this point. It came out in, like, 1995. I don't think there's any problem with downloading the original Dark Forces. Yeah, you can go buy it yeah. on GOG, but it's also existed in the community for 30-plus years. I don't have any problem with anyone downloading the original Doom. I, I don't. <laughs> and so there, yeah. there is a little bit of give and take and what is your morality and where does that exist? Um, yeah, you know, and I think, I don't know, there's a lot of interesting gray areas and I always like seeing how certain spaces handle it. And like one of the things you, you see a lot on like itch.io is uh, like community copies, which I think is a really cool concept. And they might say, I'm providing X number of community copies of this thing that I think is cool and important. And if you can't, if you don't think you, you can afford it for any reason, no questions asked, you can have one of these community copies. And yeah. like, yeah, you could argue that a lot of bad faith actors just scoop them up, but then the creator could just add more, Yeah, you know? Or it'd be like, wow, clearly there's a need for this product, this thing that I made. And actually and if speaking I want of to can DRM free, here it is on GOG. I'm going to take it out there of my go. Steam cart and add it on GOG. I didn't know that GOG had it. I hadn't seen the ad yet. So GOG has Dark Forces Remaster. Go get it there. Yeah. It's, it's DRM yeah. free. Yeah. Or, you know, just play modern games that don't suck at. No, I'm just... <laughs> uh, I couldn't even get it out. Uh... <laughs> You play Morrowind anyway. on the original vinyl, right? <laughs> I transcended vinyl. It's all magnetic tape, baby. Now, we talked a little bit about game preservation and, and, and the history of zeros and ones. And uh, there is a certain thing that a lot of media is at risk of being lost to the ethos of time. Yeah. Uh, one of the most famous examples is Nintendo for the SNES had a Japanese only, a Jap Japan oh, yeah. region only exclusive service uh, called Satellivu or Satellite View. Uh, Satellivu, I think is what it was correctly coined. It was for the Super Famicom. Um, it was a subscription service. You paid, you know, five, six dollars a month. And by the way, Sega also had Sega TV with a, with a coax card. Right. That and this you is where you would download Genesis, and you could like download, download content, right? You could download games and, and exclusive content. Um, Satellaview is famous because there were a number of games that were only ever playable on Satellaview if you had a subscription. And you could only save so many versions or so many downloads and games yeah. onto your cartridge because they'd be replaced every month. Um, and so there are some... Uh, canon Zelda linked to the past you know after stories or, or you know expanded content that is completely lost because the cartridges that held that data no longer exist or were thrown away or scrapped or whatever else um, there's a really cool thing that just happened though uh, and it has to do with F-Zero and Yes, Vince, if you're watching, I included the story just for you. Uh, F-Zero had some exclusive tracks that were released on Satellaview. Uh, and a lot of people thought they were lost. In fact, there, there's a $5,000 bounty. If you have a cartridge that has this download on it, people will pay you $5,000. There's a community bounty of $5,000 if you have these tracks. Um, well... It's probably one of those things that's lost because this was 1996 and 1997. And so the idea that, number one, the writable memory on a cartridge would have been saved in that exact state for that exact month that that content was downloaded to the cartridge and that the coin cell battery would survive long enough for that flash to be read because it was volatile memory. Uh, if the battery dies, you don't just lose your save files you lose your download files. That's a thing. It's a thing we dealt with with Palm Pilots. If your batteries die, your PDA gets wiped. That was a fun yeah. time. Um, anyway. Dealing with that with my Alpha Smart. 
Uh, this is one really cool use of AI. Now, I don't think this could be completely done to recreate the Link to the Past expanded content, but for a racing game where you need to recreate an environment or a set of boundaries uh, or a, a set of assets laid out in a, in a repeatable pattern, AI can be a fantastic tool. And so there's a group of modders that came together and they found some VHS recordings, speaking of time shifting, of the BSF0, uh, the Satellaview F0 tracks, and recreated it with the help of AI. They think that the tracks are 99% accurate because this AI system went frame by frame through the VHS recording of these tracks being played and then created the, th the landscape uh, for, for the tracks. And then they could then enter those into game data and F-Zero is very repeatable. There's only a couple of different assets that exist on the track. There's the track yeah. itself. There's the walls. There's the textures. There's uh, jumps. There's healing pads. And there's a couple other little items here and there. Um, that's it. It doesn't take a lot of work for this particular game to be recreated from scratch. And so they did. And so now if you want to play BSX, uh, BSX Leagues, uh, you can play the resurrected tracks via download. Uh, it's via it's downloadable via GitHub. Uh, it's a mod for an existing F0 ROM for the SNES. So you have to have an F0 ROM to play it. Get that of your own legal volition. Speaking of this whole conversation. And yeah, you can now play games that were once or tracks that were once thought to be lost to time. Interesting. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting future for sure. It's one of my favorite uh, episodes in uh, Cowboy Bebop, the anime, when uh, they get themselves like a, a tape that needs to be played for video. And they go down, they find some old VHS player, VCR, you know, and then they realize, oh, actually, it's Betamax. So then they got to go down and find a Betamax. It's like that, but for, you know, computing, for games. You know, someday we might find uh, these remnants of this stuff left over, but are we going to have the tools to read it and play it? And It's going to be interesting. Uh, so apparently I did pronounce the Teleview correctly. I thought I did. Uh, uh, and uh, apparently Vince says it's not coin cell or volatile backed flash. It's actually flash. That's kind of cool. The idea that Nintendo would produce cartridges with non-volatile memory is kind of crazy. So I didn't know that. I, I, I figured they were using volatile flash memory. So that's cool. Um... And uh, Vince also said to Doom, to be fair, Doom is open source. The engine is open source. And there's a shareware version of the first episode of Doom. Uh, uh, but the entire game of Doom is not open source. Nor is Doom 2. So. Cool. Cool. Are we drunk enough? Do we want to touch on the last one? I don't think so. <laughs> Jeff, I'm always ready to touch on the last one, but we definitely don't have to go there. We'll probably hit that in the after party. Something, <laughs> something, social media, something, something. It is an election year after all. Uh, human rights be damned. Yeah, fuck him. Oh, well, hey, well, there we go. <laughs> Welcome to the show, everybody. Yes. <laughs> this is your once weekly show about past, human rights we're, we're violations worldwide. We're okay. We're okay. <laughs> Only the true dedicated regulars heard that one. Yeah. Uh, how's the beer, Jeff? Uh, this one's interesting. Um, so this is supposed to be 
the extremely extreme Russian Imperial Stout. I would so it's it's the two hundred. By the way, Adroit Theory two hundred. Uh, toasted coconut, cocoa nibs, peanut butter, pretzels, and maple syrup. The maple, which is usually more of a subdued flavor, in in a lot of it's kind of a, a kiss on the end of your flavor profile. The whole beer to me is kind of syrupy. It's it's not it's not all I had hoped for. Uh, I mm. I wanted like I knew this was going to be a fairly sweet, a fairly savory beer uh, from the outset, just based on coconut, cocoa nibs, peanut butter, pretzels. Like you you put. Cocoa and peanut butter, you know, you're you're sucking on a, on a Reese's peanut butter cup is basically what I expected. What I got was like a Reese's peanut butter cup that's also drenched in maple syrup. And any element of beer or stout or roast or coconut or any other flavors that should be there are barely an afterthought. And so to me, this is literally like drinking coffee syrup straight out of the bottle mm, like, that's a bummer yeah that's a bummer it's it's not uh, and i know at 14 percent, it's not going to be very carbonated this is a beer that could use a little bit of recarbonation this is a beer that yeah. i think needs needs a little bit of that bitterness a little bit of that co2 to bitter it out and liven it up just a bit i mean don't get me wrong i'm gonna drink it um but yeah I'm I'm going to go ahead and address this one. I usually don't, but F it. It's late in the show. Kyle. Let's hear it. Kyle. F off. Uh, disappointed oh. you're not pedaling more. I'm assuming that's 45 drives product. You got removed. Sweet, sweet kickback. I know he got removed. I'm still going to address it because a couple of these comments have been showing up. And I think Kyle's been on there, been in my comment section too. A couple of people are really pissed off that I'm showing off 45 drive stuff. Do you know how much money I've ever received from 45 drives? Zero. Do you know how much kickback I get from 45 drives? Zero. I'm one of the YouTubers who has one of the most upfront and honest disclosures in the industry. I am more than happy to say where my money comes from and where my money doesn't come from. And if someone gave me a product versus I bought a product. And the fact that I can do a home lab tour of my entire server rack top to bottom. And the only thing in that server rack I didn't spend my money for is the 45 drives chassis. And you think I'm peddling a chassis that I replaced with, mind you, a 4U 24 bay chassis? If you think the 15 bay won me over over the 24 because 45 drives gave me that, I pulled a 24 bay out of my server rack to put the 15 bay in there. Didn't get paid for it. I genuinely think it's good hardware. I genuinely think it's accessible for home labbers. And I know Kyle is gone. Piss off Kyle, don't come back. Kyle's the new Todd? No, Todd is the old Todd. Screw Todd, too. Yeah, you kept the frame and the chassis. And that's all I kept from that. Like, even inside of that box. You know how much money I spent inside of that box? <laughs> oh, what are you going to do? Guy's name's Kyle. He's got life hard enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Kyle, if your biggest problem with my channel is uh, uh, would love to buy one if half the price, you don't understand economics, do you? You're upset at me that they gave me a server that you can't afford and you want to afford it, but you'll only pay half the price. You don't understand how money works, do you? <laughs> you don't understand the intricacies of manufacturing and distribution, do you, Kyle? Yeah, Kyle. Come back with another fake profile, Kyle. Maybe you can pick a cooler name, Kyle. God damn it, Kyle. 
Don't come in here and accuse me of being a shill. You will get told. Why do I start every review with, thanks to this company for sending out this product for my unbiased review? Like all reviews on the channel, no money changed hands. This company has no say over the content of this video, nor will they get the opportunity to review the footage before it goes live. What I will say is part of that. If I do have something that is very unexpected in the review, hey, they said X performance, but I'm seeing Y. I will contact them and say, are my results valid? I will not give them the opportunity to change. I will give them the opportunity to explain their benchmarking methodology versus mine. And so I can either confirm or deny their findings. Right. But it's 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 less it's less are these results valid and less like, hey, did I do something different than you guys? Right. Did I screw up? No, because I'm testing versus against my criteria, not theirs. What I will do is I will contact a company and say, my results are unexpected based on your benchmarks. Can you confirm my numbers there you go. are not yeah. a mistake? Um, that's the only input a company ever gets, is if I have something that I am going to say that is drastically a front to what they've already said in their marketing materials. And the only chance that they get is you're accurate or you're not. That's it. Yeah. And do you know how valuable the 45 drive server is to me? Uh, I Again, I pulled a 24 bay NAS that was running just fine out of my rack to put the, the 45 drives in there. I paid for the drives in that chassis. I paid for the memory in that chassis. 45 Drive sent me 16 gigs of memory. There's a terabyte of RAM in that server right now. I didn't need that chassis. That chassis has zero value to me. That chassis has zero influence over my opinions of it. Gosh. Piss off, Kyle. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Nothing like having my integrity question because someone's too poor to buy a server. It's great. I I get like hardware envy, you know. I get it. I get it. But like normal people don't. I don't know. It's normal people don't go after YouTubers or people because they have hardware envy. <laughs> the other thing I love to say is uh, I I. Someone on on a recent video um, said uh, when when I when I went hard on the dust <laughs> when I when I went hard on <laughs> yeah my server's dusty it's in my garage do you understand what a garage is like yeah. um, they've said they always say that but but they but they said uh, well you don't have to worry about your hardware you get all your hardware for free oh god and I went and I, I said the same thing the only thing in this rack I didn't pay for is the chassis. I just spent more on UPS batteries than I've ever received from any of these companies that are represented in my in my server rack. The servers that I've gotten to review that are like, you know, multi-thousand dollar servers, I have to send back. Do you notice I don't have any super micro chassis, even though I've reviewed three of them in the last 12 months? Uh, yeah. You know, AMD Sienna and, and Xeon 2400 series and, and Ice Lake and all that. It's because I don't get to keep those. Yeah. But you know what you got from me? Still an unbiased review. A couple of my loved, a couple of my shit all over. And you know yeah. what? Supermicro still samples me because they respect my opinions within the industry of living in this industry and being an authority within this industry. That's why I get review samples. It's not for your benefit. It's also for theirs. It's so I can tell them that the product is crap to their face, which I have before. Back when I was uh, going to the studio every day, it was like a race every time we'd post a video to see what, uh, who the first commenter asking for parts would be. And it was always like in the top 10, always in the top 10 commenters. Well, if you don't like it, give it to me. Yep. yep. Classic. Uh, I, I love answering the question, how do I get free equipment on YouTube? Well, the first step is to spend $20,000 out of your own pocket to get your first thousand subscribers. 
because that's about what it cost me. $20,000 sunk into a hobby. That was not my livelihood. That was not anything. You know how much money I've spent creating this channel? It's a lot. <laughs> you, know how much, you know how much it costs to operate this business? It's a lot. It's a hell of a lot more than someone sending me a chassis. <laughs> my family doesn't eat chassis. I wish they ate handhelds and mini PCs, because good lord. <laughs> Classic. Guys, I love Ugh. what you do, but what the F is this product? I've said that many times. I've said that about a lot of different people. <laughs> uh, cool. Thanks, Kyle. Now get lost. All right. Boom. Normally I'd say it's 15 past the hour, but it's 25 past the hour because Rhett showed up 10 minutes late. Uh, it was six minutes late, but what are you going to do? It was six. It was 6.09 when I started the video. <laughs> well, it was 6.06 .06 when I logged on. <laughs> you logged on at 6.06. .06. Whatever, that sounds like it was not my fault. Could have been 6.06. <laughs> .06. Could have been the other Rhett. <laughs> I blame Kyle. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank Kyle, you all. For one dollar a month, you can join the Patreon and come to the after party. <laughs> yeah. Now, what's funny is they're going to yell at me for uh, I, I got an HL15 chassis for free today. I started reviewing a blade server that I spent $600 of my own money just for the chassis on, uh, plus CPUs and memory well exceeding $2,000 of value. And the, I spent more money on the last video than I've ever received from 45 drives, excluding the time they flew me out to ask me what they, th what I thought of 45 drives as a company. Um, yeah, they flew me out. Guess what? I also can't be bought with a hotel room. <laughs> I can. I also happily slapped 45 drives engineers across the face and said, what are you doing in this market? You're doing it completely wrong. I, I, I kind of gave them what hell for the HL15 and said, you're aiming at the wrong market if you're trying to enter the home lab. I think the HL15 is a great product, but it's a small, medium business product. It's not a home lab product. It's certainly not priced like a home lab product. I told them directly to their face. When I got the, the HL15, you know what I said? It's a great product. And at $800, you can't find anything else like it. Is it the product I would have liked to seen marketed towards home labs? No. But I can't argue with the price. So it's still got a good review for me. Remember Jeff's flying partner dresses as a bird? Yeah, yeah. other Jeff dressed, dressed as a pigeon on that flight. That was interesting. <laughs> Also, they flew me Air Canada. <sighs> like, that should explain itself. But two of the four flights that I was on in that entire trip, it, it was PDX to Toronto, Toronto to uh, to Nova Scotia, uh, to Sydney, and then Sydney to Toronto, and then Toronto to PDX. One leg of each flight was canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what a fantastic travel experience I had on 45 drives time. <laughs> I like Jeff reviews, honest and spot on. It's all I can ask from you. It's not even a real airline. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for watching. This has been episode 323 of Talking Heads. Join us every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time for the latest in beer and tech news right here on YouTube. Like this video if you liked it. Subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Join us on Patreon. Give us a dollar. Join the Discord server. Get part of the after party that happens every single Wednesday night immediately following this show. Chat with myself, John, Rhett, Steve, all the hosts from Talking Heads, uh, live and in person or throughout the week. Uh, we... We are pretty much always online. It is a great time. 
Uh, but for even more direct uh, support of the channel, craftcomputing.store. Take advantage of my merch that is designed and made 100% in-house by me, not by AI. <laughs> for now. no. I just, <laughs> if AI could do a better job, I would probably use it, but it can't. <laughs> uh, laser cutting, as it turns out, is a pretty precise art form. Mm. Um, no. Uh, I design all of the merch. I, you know, it's good merch. Not, not going to lie. Uh, but I do all the design work. I do all the cutting. My wife does all the shipping. It is truly a 100% in-house business. Uh, go support us. Buy a couple of things. Uh, we have wallets now. Oh. We have wallets now. Minimalist wallets. I can't, I can't call them what everyone else is going to call them because of advertisers. That has also advertised on my channel. I, I don't imagine they're going to be advertising on my channel again. Uh, but uh, yeah, Plus, we have wallets now. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. After party is lurker friendly? Absolutely. You don't have to turn on a camera. You can sit there and listen. It's like it's like, you know, talking heads after dark. It's exactly what it is. It's lots of things friendly. I take off my shirt. It's a good time. Yeah. You know? Play a little uh wah 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 wah. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for watching. And as always, we'll see you next week. Cheers all. Cheers everyone. Fuck you, Kyle.